Good to have everybody with us this morning. As we continue our study now in the uh, types of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. The Holy Ghost, as it's as he's translated sometimes in the King James Bible. The object of much derision. Father, I pray now that you give me the gift of teaching. Open our hearts to receive your word. Glorify thee this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now if you have fun, I'm going to finish up on fire because we started fire last week. And uh, I'll refresh you just a little of what we covered last week. Fire, we talked about being a symbol of the Lord's presence. It's also a sign of His approval. It's associated with protection of God's presence, a pillar of fire. And uh, He promised to be a wall of fire around His people, Zechariah 2. It's a simile of His discipline and testing the fire. And uh, we, can, uh, we can see how that undoubtedly is so when Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were cast into the fiery furnace. And also, he says in the book of Malachi, it's a refiner of pure and purifies gold. Uh, it's an emblem of God's Word. I don't know if we covered this last week or not. If you have Jeremiah chapter number 5 and verse 14, I don't believe we got that far. Jeremiah 5 and verse number 14 Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, because ye speak, because ye speak this word, behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire, and this people would, and it shall devour them. Now, that's pretty simple to understand, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, the devouring fire. Uh, the word of God is not always preached to get somebody saved. Sometimes it's preached simply to glorify God. And whether they believe or whether they don't, they can, as God said in the Old Testament, they can uh, understand that uh, the, as a prophet's been in their midst or the preaching has been done. I certainly don't claim to be a prophet. But uh, the Word of God, the Lord Jesus preached it, and uh, all of them didn't believe. So the fire is consuming. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the book of uh, Jeremiah chapter number 20 and verse number 9, This is the well-known passage where Jeremiah said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. It's not that easy to just close your Bible and walk away from God. It's really not. It's not. It's not. The Lord, uh, the faith in Christ is not some philosophy that you pick up. It's not some new leaf you turn over. It's not some way you see life, you know, and the way you think. It's an absolute change of your essence and your being. And so you don't just walk away. Uh, in the book of Leviticus, chapter number 10 and verse number 2, this is one of the saddest cases in the Bible. Leviticus chapter number 10 and verse 2. If you look at verse 1, it says, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, put fire therein, put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. You need to remember that Nadab and Abihu had been to the mountain. They were among those who saw the Lord, privileged to be in the coming to the presence of God. When I say saw the Lord, I say saw the Lord in the sense that the Old Testament presents it to you. The Bible says plainly that no man hath seen God, but he, they saw a manifestation of the Lord. They had strange fire. What would strange fire be? Where would they, where, where, 
where does the fire come from? If you go into the, into the holy place to burn incense on the altar of incense, which is right before the, the curtain that separates the holy of holies from the holy place, where do you get that fire from? It comes off the brazen altar. It comes off of the altar of sacrifice. And somebody said, well, that might be a small thing, not with God. Because it's the altar of sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ that the Holy Spirit has given to all of us. The Holy Spirit comes through Christ, folks. No other way. Somebody claims to have the Holy Spirit and they don't honor the Lord Jesus Christ, they're a liar and a deceiver. Look at who they are. They've got a spirit, all right, but it's not the Holy Spirit. It must come through Christ. If they do not glorify the Lord Jesus, they know nothing of the Holy Spirit. So Nadab and Abihu went into the in, in to burn incense. And they took strange fire. So where did that fire come from? It doesn't make any difference, but it didn't come off of the altar. And so what happened? Well, look at verse 2. There went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. That must have been a horrible thing. <clears throat> because <clears throat> these are the two sons of Aaron. Notice. The sons of Aaron. Who is Aaron? He's the high priest. He's the one who goes on behind the veil and goes into the Holy of Holies one time a year, seventh month, tenth day of the month, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. He goes in there and represents the people. Now his two sons have been incinerated right there in the holy place. It tells you that God, uh, that certain things are holy to God. He'll tolerate a lot of things from a lot of people in a lot of different ways, just like he has from all of us. But there are certain lines that God draws, and there are certain uh, places you don't cross, and if you cross them, you're finished. And this is what uh, John's talking about in 1 John 5. He said, if you see a brother, he's not sending a sin into death, pray for him. But if he is sending a sin into death, don't pray for him. In 1 Corinthians 5, he said plainly, to turn such an one over to the devil for the destruction of the flesh. All right? This is a brother. How do you know he's a brother? Because of, the con because of the consequences of what he was doing. He had his father's wife turn him over to the devil for the destruction of the flesh. That's a sin unto death. What he was doing was a sin unto death. But that's, uh, you know, that's what he was doing that led to a sin unto death. So God... Uh, God, uh, God intervened. It's a scary thing when you go to your prayer closet and you pray. It's very scary, folks. Very scary when you go in there and you start praying. And you start to call out a name. And God won't let you call that name out. Have you ever had that happen? That happened to me this past week. And I tried it again for two more times. I want to make certain it was God. I wanted to make sure. Third time God said, don't. Ask me again. He was pretty clear about it. I wanted to make sure it wasn't my mind or it wasn't some spirit lying, some deceiving, impersonating, familiar spirit. And God did. He made it plain. I said, all right. In that, in that closet, I backed off. I backed off. If you'll remember, Samuel prayed for Saul, didn't he? You remember he prayed for Saul? He prayed for him and he prayed for him and prayed for him. But God finally said, Samuel, why do you keep coming to me? I'm going to paraphrase it. So why do you keep coming to me, praying for Saul, seeing how I have rejected him? In other words, leave me alone. So why does he do that, preacher? Because if you belong to the Lord and you're praying, you've got your heart right with God, he's obligated to hear you. See, he's obligated to hear you. He will hear you. And if you're interceding for someone else, like I talked about the other night, and I preached that message about intercession before this happened, and you're praying, and, and, and uh, God hears you, but when He says, enough, I will not hear it again. I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to tell you you can't pray. You go ahead and keep praying, but don't pray for that individual again. That scared me when that, when that happened, because I, if, if that continues like that, I know what's coming. That individual's finished. Folks, don't you realize this morning that your life is in the hands of God? It's not, your, your life's not in the doctor's hands. 
Your life is in the hands of God. And uh, the old poet said, in him we live and move and have our being. And that's quoting a pagan poet in the book of Acts, but it's the truth. The Bible said, my life is hid with Christ in God. So you don't mess with some things. You just don't mess with them. When, uh, J. Uh, when, uh, J. Harold Smith sat right over there when he preached for us, and I knew J. Harold Smith personally, loved him and respected him, and, to, and do to this day. J. Harold Smith was a Southern Baptist preacher, and uh, he loved the Lord. No doubt in my mind, he loved the Lord. And he preaches, he preaches mes his message called God's Three Deadlines. And the Three Deadlines, uh, it's a powerful thing. One of them is sending away your day of grace. The other one is the sin unto death. What's the other one? What? The unpardonable sin. The Lord said, Neither is there forgiveness in this world or the world to come. Which immediately brings up a lot of thinking. You've got to, there's some things in the Bible that aren't. Uh, here's the problem with people. They want to make the Bible black and white, put it in a box, categorize everything, systemize it like systematic theology where you can master it. And I'm going to tell you right now, there are things in the Bible you will never master. God intends it to be that way. He's the sovereign, and He holds life and death in His hand. He makes the final uh, judgment, and I'll leave it in His hand. If He says there's no forgiveness in this world or the world to come, let it stand just the way He says it. Leave it alone. Leave it alone. I'll just leave it alone. I won't try to explain it away to fit Baptist doctrine or Pentecostal doctrine. I'll leave it alone. So Nadab and Abihu died. Where'd they go? Of course, you always ask that question, don't you? I don't think it went. I don't think it sent them to hell. No, I don't believe that. But they paid the ultimate price in this world for what they had done. They knew better. You see, when Uzzah put his hand up there, the, the Philistines could take that. Ark of the Covenant and pick it up and set it on a cart. How'd they get away with that? They could, they could put it on a cart. It didn't belong on a cart. How was the ark to be carried? To, through staves and only by certain people. Kohath and Merari were the sons of Aaron. Kohath and Merari, the tribe of Kohath and Merari, were the ones who were responsible for taking care of the tabernacle to put it up and take it down and, and transporting it and all of that. And because of that, God gave them special grace. He gave them grace to put up something that only the high priest could see. But think about it. They put it up. They took it down. They put it back up. God gave them grace to do that. And so when the ark went off in the hands of the Philistines, they stuck it in the house of Dagon. That's poor Dagon. He's in bad shape. <laughs> he didn't last long. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't want to have been Dagon, would you? I, would, I wouldn't want to be some false pagan god when the Almighty shows up like he did in Egypt. But in any event, they put him in the, put him in, the, in, the, in the temple of Dagon, half fish and so forth, and he was finished. So they took it and they began to move it around, and the Bible said God smote them with them rods. They couldn't handle much of it. I don't remember exactly how long the ark stayed with them, but it wasn't too long. I think it was less than a year, wasn't it? A few months, uh, six months, nine months. It's been a while since I've looked at that, but it didn't take long. They were done with it. <laughs> so they wanted to get rid of this thing, put it on a cart. And, and had kine, cattle, pulling it. And they sent it. And when they came, they came to the place called Beth Shemesh, which means the house of the sun. All right? They're ignorant. They don't know any better. They're, they're stupid of holy things. You know, nothing is being done in their heart through guile or rebellion. They're just ignorant. But boy, when the men of Beth Shemesh looked into that, the Bible said they left it and went away. You know the story about how the kind had been taken from their calves and all of that, and they went on anyway, lowing, and that's unnatural. And so the, the Philistines knew that God was in it, whoever that God was. And when the men of Beth Shemesh came, the Bible says they went and looked into that ark. What happened? Tens of thousands of them died. Tens of thousands. Why? Because they knew that holy God. That's why. And the ark had been put in the house of uh, uh, Benadab. And one of his sons was Uzzah. And that ark had been there for a long time. And Uzzah grew up around that ark. He knew all about it. It was familiar to him. He respected it, honored it, he loved it. But the Bible says that when they put that ark on a cart and took it out of there, that ark began to move. The cart was shaking because of something in the road. And Uzzah put his hand up there to stop it from falling. That's all he was doing. 
He meant well. It was a good thing as far as he was concerned. What happened to Uzzah? And they changed it to para Uzzah from that point on. Because para means breach. Perez, you know. Perez, the first one born. They tied a, they tied a cord around his finger. Two sons of Tamar. Perez in Hebrew means a breach. Perez Uzzah. So he was smitten dead. Why? Because he knew better. He knew. This is why the Lord said in the book of John, chapter number 9, He said, You say you have no sin. You say you see. John 9, the man born blind said, You say you see. He said, Therefore your sin remaineth, because you say you see. You can't plead ignorance. You can't plead unknowing. Therefore your sin remaineth. Because light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light. It is the rejection of light that does you in. What sends men to hell? The fact that Christ has preached to them and the Word of God has given to them the great grace of God's Word, the offer of salvation, and they say no to it. And God says no to you. It's that simple. Sin does not send you to hell. Rejection of Christ sends you to hell. That's what does the job. That'll do it. And so he judged them. It speaks of his judgment. In the book of Acts, uh, chapter number 2 and verse 3, Acts 2, 3, that means that you ought to walk softly, as uh, Roosevelt said, and leave your big stick at home <laughs> when, it comes to, uh, when it comes to serving the Lord. Walk softly, like Ahab. You remember when the Old Testament, when Ahab, <clears throat> when, the, when the prophet preached him, what did the Bible say about Ahab? He came softly. <laughs> He did. Ahab began to walk softly. And God said, see how he's doing now? <laughs> and so apparently his, his repentance was genuine. His fear certainly was. Uh, in Acts chapter number 2, and verse number 2, Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them cloven tongues, like as a fire, and it set upon each of them. What is a cloven tongue? It's a what? It's a split tongue. Forked. It's a forked tongue. That's what it is. And it, and it, uh, and it set up on each of them. That's a strange thing. I was watching a documentary yesterday where they found this sword. This farmer found a sword about 1910, 1920. Not a sword. Not a sword. That's another one. He found the cross. He found a bunch of crosses. And these crosses dated back to the 8th century after Christ. He found them here, folks, in America, long before Columbus ever sailed the ocean blue. The history that you've been taught in the public school system is just a bunch of junk. There, there is stuff all over North America that does not fit in the history, uh, in the picture you get of history. In any event, he found this. But one of the things that he found on it was a picture of some kind of a lizard or something that had a forked tongue. Now, the old Indian saying was, he speaketh with forked tongue. What does that mean? He's lying. Everybody will know what that means. Something here there. They, they did that, you know. The sign language. You see, the Indians could communicate with each other even though they didn't. Uh, they all had their own languages. The Iroquois was a big language up in the Northeast. But they could communicate with each other through sign language. They learned how to do that. And that forked tongue meant that he's a liar. That's what they said about a man. That, that's what they said about white man's justice. Just a little side here on this thing. Every treaty the white man ever made with the Indian, he broke. The he is the white man, not not the red man. Every one of them, they broke them. But in any event, the uh, the forked tongue is an indication of uh, of uh, of something that uh, may not be necessarily genuine. Now, remember in the Old Testament where it says that the water, God said water, he put water, they, they filled, they put, poured water in around an altar. How do you remember that? What was that? Where was that? Somewhere in the Old Testament. Somebody's, who was that? There's some prophet dealing with that. Carmel. I've been to the top of Carmel. They've got a statue up there to Elijah. It's quite a thing. And uh, they did, the, got all the water, and the water they'd had seven years of, what was it? Was it seven or three and a half? How many? Three and a half? I'm just trying to pull this stuff off the top of my head. But they had 
all this time they hadn't had any rain, and yet they came up, they came up with all this water, and they poured it in this thing. And what does it say about that water? What happened to it? it lapped up. The flame became a, became a tongue. Lapped up like a dog laps. It became a tongue. See? It became a tongue. The tongue, therefore, is a, is a mighty powerful thing. Is what James said. Set on fire of nature. It's a... You've got to watch your tongue. So what do you say here? What's going on in Acts 2? Forked tongue. Cloven tongue. Of all the preaching I've heard on the day of Pentecost, and I've heard a lot of preaching from Pentecostals. They love this passage of Scripture. Have you ever had one deal with a forked tongue? <laughs> That's a hard one. What's that mean? That's good. That that that's that, and the fact that the message was not only for them but for others, that it was a multifaceted thing. Sure, yeah, <clears throat> I believe that. I believe it's symbolic of something. I really do. But to nail it down, be dogmatic about it. I don't know if you can do that or not. The tongue is. It sure does. It tests the temperature and taste. It certainly does. That's a good observation. Sure it is. And all these things are possible. But this is a place right here in the Bible I just want you to see where it's hard to be dogmatic about exactly what it means. But you can certainly accept it for what it says. And, uh, and that is that this tongue, cloven tongues of fire, was a representation of the power of and coming of the Holy Spirit of God. Yeah. Notice that he said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And the problem today is that men will not pay the price to have the power. Okay. And without the power, all the world you have is a religious organization compared to a secular organization. That's all. You have religious cliches, religious symbols, icons, and what have you, but you don't have power. And the reason the church today is dead is because there's no power in it. The reason it has no power is because they don't pay the price. What's the price? Fellowship and communion with God. And there's no way to get around reading your Bible and praying and communing with God. And if you don't do that, there'll be no power. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's what our brother was talking about, a serpent or a lizard. They stick that tongue out, flip it out there, and they feel the temperature. And they not only that, but they taste the air. And they can taste through their tongue. Like, and probably other sense, senses that we're not even aware of. Uh, it's, to me, it's an it's, it's a objectionable thing. I'm not too fond of snakes. I'm not a big uh, snake lover. <laughs> No, never have been. Uh, the old farmers used to like, they loved to have black snakes out in the barn. I was always told that when I was a kid growing up. So the black snakes the best thing in the world to keep the rat population down. And I'm sure, that, I'm sure they know what they're talking about, but I don't, uh, I don't like the black snake or the rat either one. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it's the truth. I don't question that. Yeah, no doubt about it. You just have to learn who you want to live with. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> Make you hurt yourself trying to get away from it. What will happen? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I ever handle one, it's by accident. <laughs> Oh, boy, I'm not a big snake lover. But I know they do a lot of these guys that milk them. You know, they get the poison out of them, use it for an uh, antidote for a snake bite. That's a good thing, a very good thing. Okay. Now, so uh, that's an emblem of the Holy Spirit coming in power, and it's wrapped in mystery. That's the only thing I can say to you. That cloven tongue, we can understand these analogies that we've given this morning, but bottom line is it's wrapped in mystery. There's mystery. And uh, I suppose that's the way it ought to be when the Holy Spirit. In Isaiah chapter number 6 and verse 7, 
Isaiah 6, 7. My granddaughter the other day was driving home when we had that monsoon come. You remember all the hard rain we had? Well, she came in the house and she was very upset. Victoria, very upset. And she told us what she had just seen. And she photographed it. A huge snake. And when I looked at that photograph, I thought, this thing may be a constrictor. You know, you've got an anaconda, a boa constrictor, and a, uh, what's that thing called, Burmese python or pythons? These are the constrictors, and they get big. They get very big. This thing looked like it was at least six feet long, or it could have been longer than that. It's hard to, it's hard to scale things sometimes. You have to have something to compare it with. But it was big. This was a big snake, and it was out there on the pavement in the subdivision where we live. Imagine how we slept that night. Really, big snake. And we've got woods right behind the house. And these bears, you know, just a few weeks ago, they've been catching bears everywhere. I'm waiting for one to come right out of the woods and me sitting on the swing. Yes, sir. Was it a black snake? A rat snake? They do a good work. <laughs> I mean, you don't want to be overrun with the rats. That's for certain. But, uh, but this was a big snake. She's got that photograph on her phone. And this thing was big. And uh, you don't have big as big. But anyway, they were big. Now, down in Florida, they've got a problem with Burmese pythons. You all know about that. And the apex uh, predators in Florida is the alligator. And now this Burmese python and the alligator are locking horns. And they're fighting over territory. And the thing is that the alligator, if he can ever get a hold of that python, the python's finished. Because the, the American alligator has the strongest bite. It's stronger than a crocodile. Huge, over a ton of pressure coming down. And imagine that kind of force. And so if it gets a hold of that snake, uh, it can be quite a, quite a battle. Yes, sir. Eating a hippopotamus. Yeah, I'll say. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they also showed an alligator, if you want to look at it, or a crocodile on YouTube, that, that, uh, that latches on to an electric eel. Yes, sir. You remember the eel I told you that could put out 600 volts? You know what happened to that crocodile? Just like that. And then it's dead. Just like that. Mother Nature's so smart, isn't she? Imagine what it, how long it took that eel to figure out what electricity was, then how to project it out of its body and electrocute something, but then how to insulate itself from, the, from its own... Yeah, a man that believes that stuff is a fool. That's all I can say. A first-rate fool. You may have a Ph.D., but if you believe in evolution, you are a first-rate fool. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, here's the thing. In the Old Testament, he talks about the sparks that fly up from a fire. And he said, since you've rejected, I'll have to paraphrase. I can't remember exactly the quotation. But he said, since you've rejected the light of the Word of God and the truth, you walk in the sparks of your own fire. See? Go ahead. Walk in the, walk in the light you create from your fire since you've rejected the truth. That's, uh, you know, that's irony. That's a, that's a mockery from God. God's mocking them. And what he's saying to them in the book of Revelation is, if you don't want the blood of Christ to cleanse you from your sin and his righteousness, go buy yourself gold and go produce it yourself. 
and see what it, and see what it uh, does for you. I think the Bible's full of that kind of uh, uh, where God uh, He does. You, you, Elijah Elijah mocked the prophets of Baal. If you'll remember, on top of Mount Carmel, when they beat themselves, they cut themselves and and lashed themselves all that time and said, Oh, Baal, hear us. Oh, Baal, hear us. Elijah stood over there and said, Where do you reckon he's at? He did. He, he, he mentioned maybe he's using the bathroom. He did. He mocked him. Exactly. It is derisive. Yes, it is. It is. And God will do that. He'll do that. Many times he says to them in the Old Testament, he says, where be thy gods? Where are your gods? Where are they? You've rejected me, now go turn to them. Where are they at? Call on them. See if they can help you. That's what's going to happen at the second advent. The Antichrist is going to lead them to battle. They're going to follow him. What do you think that creature is going to do when Almighty God appears in the heavens? I don't care how powerful any devil or any Satan or any Antichrist. What do you think that creature will do when he's confronted with Almighty God? That's what's coming. He will. The Bible says he will. He'll be consumed right in front of them. That's right. The Antichrist will. It'll be spontaneous combustion. He'll burst into flames right in front of them. And then they'll stand back and say, is this the one? That's what they'll say. They'll point at him and say, is this the one? Is this the one that turned nations against God, that led the rebellion? Is this the one? Well, yes, sir, every knee will bow. Satan will bow. Oh, yeah, he'll bow. He'll bow. And I'm sure that that 40 days in the wilderness, when he tempted Christ, tried to tempt him, I'm sure that that'll fly in front of his face. I'm sure he'll see it for what it for what he'll see himself for what he really is. He'll bow, and he'll confess that Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. He'll bow. Every knee will bow. Every knee. All right, in Isaiah chapter number six and verse seven. The Scripture says, And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. These coals were taken from the altar. From the altar. And, of course, the altar is the brazen altar. This is symbology. This is symbology. You can't purge your sins with physical fire. You can't do it. You can't offer a lamb, shed its blood, and take that blood and cleanse your sins, you see. It has to be his lamb. It has to be his fire. It has to be his altar. And this is, this is pure symbology that he's talking about here. This is symbolism that represents something far, far greater. And then finally, in, Le in Luke chapter number 24 and verse 32. Luke 24, verse 32. They said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the Scriptures? That's kind of strange, too, the way it says that. Did not our heart, or should it be our hearts? You see what happened? The Holy Spirit pulled them together. Our heart. In other words, we had one heart. They were of one mind and one accord, it says in Acts 2. When they come together with one mind, one accord. That's the thing that religion, ecumenicism, is constantly seeking for, is unity. And here's the, here's the catchphrase today. Unity in diversity. You hear that all the time. See, we, we glory in our diversity. America is a diverse nation. That's what unifies us. You're living in la-la land. <laughs> what unifies you is the truth. You, the truth separates you, sanctifies you. Christ is the great divider and unifier. There's no middle ground with him. It's been said that everywhere he went, they either had a revival or a riot. 
It's still that way. If the Christ of the Bible is preached, men will get right with God or they'll riot. It's Him. He's, he's, he, it's all about Him. And He said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw men to me. If you want one heart, have one Christ. If you want one Spirit, the Holy Spirit, then you've got to exalt the one Lord. You get these, all these people coming together and say, well, I'm a Buddhist, I'm a Confucius, I'm a Mohammedan, I'm a Christian, I'm this and that. And our strength is our diversity. No, it's no, there's no strength in that. That's coming from a brainwashed mind. That's coming from somebody who doesn't understand, who's been completely uh, reprogrammed, a, a complete paradigm shift in the way they see things and understand things. And the Bible says they'll call good evil and evil good. It's all relativism. Yes, ma'am. He certainly did. He brought them all in. Not really. No. Solomon was the man who officially made Israel a polytheistic country. That's the term, polytheistic. Polytheistic means many gods. That's what they had. And there's only one God. The prophets thundered over and over and over and over. Hear you, old Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. <clears throat> That's why we're rejected. That's why they hate us. They always have. They always will. It's because we declare to them face to face, there's just one God. There's just one Savior. I don't care how sincere you are with your God, you're dead wrong. There's just one. There is no dialogue. They won't dialogue. What's that mean? Here's what it means. It means, well, let me tell you about Jesus, and then you tell me about your God. That's what it means. And we'll find common ground. We'll find, I'll, you tell me about your God, I'll tell you about my God. Then we'll find in here where we can agree, where the, we can find the points that we can agree on, and then we'll build our relationship on the points that we agree on. That's garbage. But that's exactly the way ecumenicism works. And here's the Bible. Let me tell you about your God. And he said, well, let me tell you about my God. I don't hear about your God. <laughs> your, God's, your God is fictitious. Your God's a lie. There's only one God. And this is why Peter stood up and said that uh, <clears throat> there's only one name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. The philosophy taught in the universities, for the, ba for the most part, is that all religions based on, on myth. Okay? Myth. And, of course, evolution is the biggest myth that's ever been fostered on the American people or the world or anybody. It is a lying myth. But all religions are based on myth. And so the way they see it is they put these bumper stickers out that say, coexist. You ever seen one? And the coexist means, all right, here's a cross. Here's a, here's a half moon. Uh, here's the Star of David. Uh, here's some Hindu symbol. Here's this and this and this and all this. In other words, they're all together. It's not like the cross is separate. But they're all together because they all have the same, uh, the same power, source. Not meaning, but the same power and the same source. Myth, mythology. And that's the way they're taught. And that's what they believe. So they accommodate you, patronize you. Uh, feed you a little bit, spoon feed you a little bit to make you feel good. But the bottom line is that the underlying spirit behind the whole system is as corrupt as it can be. The people running this country and the world worship Satan. But they would never tell you it was Satan. They worship this great spirit that empowers them to get what they want. And they may call him a lot of different names. But you and I both know who he is. He's Satan. How do you know that? He's the God of this world, and He worketh in the children of disobedience. He's the God of the world. So what does the Christian do? The Christian tolerates, on a secular level, these pagan gods, the influx of Mohammedism and all that into the country. He tolerates it to be a good citizen. But when it comes to his faith, what he believes, he doesn't give any more respect to what a Buddhist says, or to what a Mohammedan says, or to what a, a Hindu says, than he would give to a rabid mad dog. Because the source of faith and the source of truth is that Holy Bible. Right there. You can take liberalism and you can take their interpretation of history 
and they have their interpretation of history, then you can lay the Holy Bible down next to it, and you'll be amazed at how all of the lies and all the deceit and all the mythology they're talking about, there is a common thread running from the Revelation in the book of Genesis up until this present time that clarifies all of the stuff out there that they're trying to make into a big deal. It clarifies it. God revealed himself, folks. He revealed himself to one race of people. That's the Jew. He told them to write a Bible. They wrote a Bible. That revelation of God is to the Jew, through the Jew, to the church, through the Lord Jesus Christ, to the world today by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Anything that deviates from that and is outside of that is a lie and deception. I don't go to the history professor at UT to find out the truth. If the history professor at UT agrees with what the Bible says, good for him. But the Bible is the source of truth. If the history professor at UT tells me that the Old Testament history of the Jewish people is a fabrication to make them look good and to build some kind of a, to build an identity, then I look at him and I'm say, sorry, sir, what's your authority for that? What's your authority? He has no authority. He has no authority. He has no authority whatsoever. It's the Bible. The Bible is the source of truth and the absolute source of truth. That's why we say the Bible is the judge of all things. It not only judges individuals, it judges movements, it judges, it, judges, uh, it judges philosophies, it judges all of it. Yes, sir? Well, let me tell you how it'll work. You take the United States of America... All right. It's just running now probably a million and a half, two million men, army. But it can, it can produce a much bigger army than that. You take red China, it can easily field an army of 100 million. It can't necessarily move all of them. You take Russia, you take the major powers of the world, all right. On the surface, they look like they have, they have their, uh, they communicate and they have their embassies and they talk and they do this and they do that. But the bottom line is, the only thing that keeps it stable is the fact that one knows it has enough power, if it has to, to annihilate the other one, and the other one knows it. The only way that that these nations can coexist with each other is where there is a balance. It's called detente. It's a balance of power. They know that. They know that. And that's the only way it's going to work. If the United States disarmed itself, and we sat around and sang, Kumbaya, and, you know, and let's just have peace and let's, and let's, and let's smell flowers and smoke dope. And, the United, and like the flower children did back in this, when they put the flowers in the National Guard and all that. Everybody sit around and do that. How long do you think it would take Cuba, a 15th rate country, to assault the United States of America, come in and take over this nation? And if you don't think they would, you're crazy. But the thing is, Cuba wouldn't hold it. Because Russia would be right on their heels, and Russia would come in and drive out the Cubans, and Russia would take over the United States of America. And then China would seize upon the opportunity and come in from the West Coast, and you'd have probably a a divide. China would have the western part of the country, and Russia would have the eastern part of the country. And then if any other Canadians or anybody else decided they wanted to chop up some of it, they'd come in and take some of it too. The only thing that keeps America within its borders are the biggest guns. Smedley Butler, who was a Marine Lieutenant General, said 40 years ago, war is a racket. Do you realize how much money people make off of wars? They make a pile of money off of wars. Would you trust them? If you disbanded the Navy, the, the Army, the Marine Corps, the Air Force, this, this, if you disbanded all of the armed services of the United States of America, do you think, do you really believe that the other nations of the world would just sit back and sign peace treaties with us and that would be it? Or would they come in and occupy? They'd take over in a heartbeat. But the thing is that they wouldn't keep it long. Whoever had the biggest guns would be the ones who finally got it. That's the way it works. That's the way it's always worked. That's the only way it can work. Because men are fallen creatures, they're sinners, and they have their own greed, and they go after it, and they go after the resources, and they'll take them. When Saddam Hussein sent his troops down into Kuwait, 
few years ago. He overran Kuwait. Why? Because he wanted their oil. But he goes back to some kind of a thing a hundred years before which said Kuwait was once part of greater Iraq, something, something of that nature, to justify what he did. So what happened? President George Herbert Walker Bush says it won't stand because you've affected the balance of power. We won't let it stand. So the Operation Desert Storm started, and they changed it. But he did it, and if he'd gotten away with it, he'd done more of it. That's what it's about. Who's got the biggest guns? Brother Lee, will you dismiss us?